remarkable uh, time uh, during the COVID-19 um, crisis uh, that, that is affecting us all globally, of course. Um, and, and while many of the, of the uh, programs that we're putting on at ULI Toronto uh, are, are dealing uh, with things like call to action as we have tomorrow, uh, working with uh, how we can help the arts community and, and responding to um, the urgent nature of, of the moment, um, we thought it would be really important, though, to um, begin to cast our minds to some of the broader public policy implications of this um, historic moment that, that we're experiencing that clearly is going to have a lasting uh, impression on how we think about city building. So we're delighted to have uh, um, the great uh, Institute of Ryerson City Building uh, to uh, drive this exploration with us. Um, and uh, it'll be, as I said, um, today's, uh, it's the Future of Cities uh, series. Uh, today we'll be focused on the future of density, as you've seen, um, and uh, we're very excited to uh, have this uh, be our launch. Um, next slide, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, all of you uh, will, uh, not surprisingly, uh, know that you're muted and uh, um, will be muted uh, for, the, for the duration of this webcast. Uh, it's the only practical way that we could do that uh, for uh, this many people. Um, that's now almost 300 uh, logged in. Um, questions that will uh, be entertained uh, at about the 1230 mark. Uh, and I will uh, take that uh, uh, when, when Sharice is finished doing the moderation, Sharice Berta, uh, I will then um, uh, take questions as selectively as they come in. No doubt there are going to be more questions than we can address. And what we promise is that those become really, really key inputs into future explorations of webcasts that we uh, and town halls and various things that, that we'll be doing at ULI Toronto. Um, I'd like to just quickly, very briefly, ne next slide, uh, thank um, our, our sponsors. Uh, this is a time like no other uh, for us in terms of our reliance on our annual sponsors. Um, ULI Toronto, as many of you know, um, does a lot of live events and a major part of our viability is, is based on our uh, ability to bring people together in person. Um, obviously that's not going to be possible for a long time and uh, so our annual sponsors are really really critical to allowing us to do the things that we do uh, online as we're doing today. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to turn, I think Cerise Bird is probably somebody that doesn't require a lot of introduction. She is, as I mentioned, the executive director of her Ryerson City Building Institute. Um, she's working with her colleagues um, uh, and uh, board has turned uh, that institute into a true city building force in Toronto and frankly, nationally. And so it's really terrific to have uh, Cerise uh, take on this, this first conversation that we'll be doing weekly. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to you, Cerise. Thank you so much, Richard. And thanks to Alex and Denise and everyone at ULI for managing all the technical aspects of this webinar. And we're thrilled to partner with ULI on this weekly um, series because together I think we really bring a diverse and engaged audience. And I've heard we have almost 600 people signed up for today's webinar. So thanks to everyone out there in Zoom land for joining us. Um, so this Future of Cities series each week will feature one Ryerson expert and one external professional expert. So today we are joined by, um, next slide please, Denise. Where we are joined by Dr. Murtaza Hader, Professor of Real Estate Management at Ryerson's Ted Rogers School of Management and director of Ryerson's Urban Analytics Institute, which produces excellent city building research reports. They're really data rich and they're very readable. So if you haven't been to their site, I would highly recommend it. And he also produces um, a regular column in the Financial Post. And we're joined by Ken Greenberg, who's urban designer, teacher, writer, former director of design and architecture for the city of Toronto and principal of Greenberg Consultants. And he's recently a new member of the Order of Canada. And he is a co-founder of Ryerson CBI and he is a member of ULI Toronto's advisory board. So welcome to both of you for joining us. 
Thank you. Um, Thanks, Cherise. I can. All right, so we only have 30 minutes for a really exciting discussion. So we're gonna jump right into the heart of things. So by now, many of us have read or have heard about the New York Times article a couple weeks ago that sparked a fiery debate on social media, asking if density is the enemy in New York, in New York's fight against coronavirus. So, so we're going to start by hearing from both of you, hearing your initial thoughts on this. And I'm going to ask you to keep it under three minutes each. Um, but then we can get into some of the other details and expand on some some point. So, um, Murtaza, can we hear from you first on this? Sure. Um, thank you for the opportunity. It's really a pleasure and honor to be on a panel with Ken. Uh, um, I'm just going to take um, a few minutes to uh, set the things up. And this is a debate that started recently in the social media, yes, but it's not a new debate. Um, the, the earliest papers on this very topic, that is the relationship between pandemics and density date back to 1927. Um, and uh, essentially what I wanted to say is that uh, there is um, a series of a body of research available that shows that there may or there could be a link um, between the spread of pandemics and the density at which living environments exist. Um, however, going, moving beyond that, I mean, um, acknowledging the fact that there's no definitive um, one uh, universal truth about it. There's still a debate about it, but there's increasing evidence. Um, the The bottom line is, what does it mean for us for city building? Um, does it mean that we um, uh, look at the tweet from um, Andrew Como and say, that's it, we should uh, put a break on the way we build cities? Or we decide um, that, no, let's look at the very best of what we have created over the years and see how it would inform this particular um, this um, episode of social distancing um, inform our future city building. I must say that this is one of the largest social experiments in the history of mankind. We have never done um, any such thing in the past where a few billion people have been told uh, to stay away from each other. Um, Aristotle taught us that man is a social animal. Um, uh, and now we are being told to be a, uh, unsocial or be at least not being interacting. Um, the, the, the few things that I want to talk about um, when, it, when it comes to density, density is one proxy of the built environment. It's not the only definitive thing, but it is something that excites urban planners the most. They see most planning through the lens of uh, density. And density is not necessarily a variable. It's a ratio between two variables, that is population divided by area. So, so you have to be mindful of it in the fact that it's a ratio. The question is, what kind of density? Um, is it the New York density that we are looking at, which is 28,000 persons per square mile? Or is it the next dense place in the United States, which is 17,000 persons per square mile in San Francisco? Or is it for us in Toronto? Our, we are 250 square miles in the city of Toronto, not the greater Toronto area. And we have roughly uh, 2.7 million people, so 11,000 persons per square mile. The bottom line is that when you look at city building, when you look at the last 100 years, and, and then when you compare it with the last 50 years, we realize that research is showing that um, while it may appear that we are densifying, the reality is that we are not. Um, our growth in the recent past, in the last few decades, has been that of sprawl rather than densification. Cities have grown across the world. This is research from New York uh, City, uh, New York University showing that the cities have grown more through sprawl than through densification. At the same time, um, should we just look at the extremes of density, such as New York City at one end and maybe Houston at the other, or we look at the, the, the diversity of, of density and the workable density that I see so, so widely available in, in neighborhoods across Toronto, in neighborhoods across Montreal. Um, for me, I think um, the future of city building will not be tied to one particular threshold of density, um, but it will be uh, cognizant of the fact that uh, the two challenges that come with density may require some creative solutions. And that is that uh, the two biggest challenges that I see with density are a traffic congestion or mobility related congestion. And those, the other one is the affordability. Um, may that be rental ownership or commercial uh, rents. And I believe that whereas we will be able to find a vaccine for COVID-19 in the near future, um, there's no vaccine for congestion. There is no vaccine for affordability unless 
we learn some lessons from the social distancing and see if we can relieve some pressure of this central place on the central places across the cities and, and, and rethink um, uh, our, our approach towards um, the agglomeration of, of urban spaces that we have done. Thank you. Great, thanks Mataza. Just about three minutes and 15 seconds, so pretty good. Um, so Ken, over to you. Yeah, thanks Cherise. Um, I would start by saying when you look at this headline, my first reaction is that this is an unwarranted knee-jerk reaction. It's a, crest, a classic case of fight or flight, and this is flight. It's kind of suggesting that flight is the answer. And if we were to follow that prescription, we would be creating a far worse problem by undermining our response to the other major challenge of our time, which is how we deal with climate change. More to unpack about that later. Um, the other thing is that this correlation is based on one variable, a ratio, as Mutessa has said, without much context. So you have to ask yourself the question, why have much denser cities than New York, like Hong Kong, Singapore, Seoul, and Taipei, all had fewer cases per capita? And clearly there are a bunch of other issues, infrastructure, organization, healthcare system, preparedness, governance, early intervention, testing and tracing, social discipline, and so on. By the same token, why have lower density rural areas been hit so hard, like Lombardia and the Veneto in Italy, um, in the US, New Rochelle or Kirkland, Washington? So clearly something else is going on, which is not only about density. There is a history of this kind of reaction of blaming cities when it comes to uh, outbreaks of disease and epidemics, pandemics. Um, in the early 20th century, it led to uh, a bunch of solutions were about, which were about diluting cities, and they did not turn out so well. The towers in the park in Europe, post-war, uh, auto-oriented sprawl in North America and elsewhere. The truth is that big cities, dense cities, are where we solve big problems. That's where we adapt. That's where the hygiene revolution has occurred. Uh, you can take this all the way back to Roman times, the introduction of drainage um, and clean water systems, vaccination, uh, where doctors and hospitals are, where research is done. So there's much to be said for dense cities in terms of dealing with this kind of challenge. But clearly not all density is good. And there are two quotes that I wanna use, one from Jonathan Barnett, an urban designer, very simply, it's not how dense you make it, it's how you make it dense. And the second from Jane Jacobs, who in 1961 made this very important distinction between density and overcrowding. Overcrowding being the real problem and often being a function of poverty and discrimination. And again, I wanna come back to that in the discussion. So what does density well done, good density look like? Clearly it is not just clusters of tall towers. It's about making what we often call complete neighborhoods. It's about social infrastructure. It's about resiliency being built into neighborhoods and very importantly, redundancy, having multiple ways of doing things in times of stress. So my conclusion is cities will survive and prosper. They're here to stay. I don't predict a reversal. I think this reaction clearly has stirred up uh, a lot of discussion. Isolation, such as we're experiencing now, I think is a temporary measure in extremists. I don't think we're going to see a social recession along with an economic recession. But I think we have to think about how we make cities differently in many ways. How much more time have I got, Cherise? Um, yeah, you could just finish up there, Ken. Okay. Great. Um, so I'm hearing um, a lot of convergence from both of you. And I'm hearing that it's not so much density per se, but it's, it's how we do density and it's the built form and how we design our cities. And Murtaza, I'm hearing from you is that maybe this is also an opportunity to tackle 
um, some of the very pervasive problems with our cities, and you mentioned affordability and you mentioned um, congestion. So, so I'd like to unpack that issue a little bit. Um, you know, when we talk about doing density better, um, most of you know, I always, I always talk about our regional development patterns as, as tall and sprawl, that we've been building low density outward development and, and tall condo towers concentrated in centers and nodes of, of very high growth. So is there a better balance? Is there an opportunity here um, to, for a better way of doing density that can build livable, walkable neighborhoods, access to essential services. And in, in a sense, what is good or bad density? What should we be striving for? Do you think that this is an opportunity to build better density going forward? Or do you think the tall and sprawl pattern will continue? So. I'll start with Ken this time, and then we'll go to Murtaza. Yeah, I mean, clearly there is not one template that fits all when we're talking about a city region, in the case of Toronto city region, that's growing to 10 million people. There are a variety of scales, a variety of densities. There's a, there's a hierarchy. But I think uh, I would not exclude the fact that there's a place for tall buildings. I think as many people have pointed out, we've had these two extremes and we have ignored, uh, very unfortunately, a lot of solutions that fall within the middle. But I want to switch from just the discussion of density in terms of how big buildings are to what goes into those buildings. And one of the issues is, and, and this goes to um, Jane Jacobs' distinction between density and overcrowding. Um, overcrowding can occur in very low density, which makes us very vulnerable. We're seeing that in uh, long-term healthcare uh, places around our country, which are typically in low density areas, and yet people are extremely overcrowded within them. So what kind of spaces occur within the buildings, not only for living arrangements, but for all the other things that we need to do. And increasingly the discussion now is about, you know, to use uh, uh, an expression that's grained a lot of currency, 15 minute neighborhoods or 20 minute neighborhoods, meaning how many things in the course of your daily life can you do within walking distance, which simultaneously addresses the issue of resiliency, redundancy, having many ways to do things, many ways to meet those daily needs, but also deals with the big issue of environmental sustainability. It actually brings these two things together rather than seeing them in opposition. And so focusing on social infrastructure on amenities, on services, on dealing with the full range of the population, on social inequities becomes extremely important. Also, in the same way that we think about environmental sustainability, and we've now understood when we're dealing with hydrology, that when we have periods of high water, the water has to go somewhere. How about thinking of, in social terms, what happens in periods of crisis? Where do people go? What other ways do they have to deal with their needs? And how can we make dense, compact, walkable neighborhoods have those qualities? Murtaza, do you want to comment on, um, on good, bad density, um, what we should be striving for? And if you think um, this this moment provides an opportunity to solve some of these big challenges um, that we're facing right now in cities. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, I think the, um, you know, going back to when I was a graduate student of engineering at University of Toronto, I wanted to pick two problems, one for my master's and one for my doctorate, problems that I was thinking would not be solved in my lifetime so that I can have a career and I don't have to switch. And I picked uh, housing uh, for my master's and traffic for my, my PhD. And, um, and, and 25 years later, we, are st uh, stuck in, we were stuck in traffic um, as Anthony Downs wrote a book and then he wrote a follow-up, we are still stuck in traffic. 
now we are stuck in traffic, but we are also stuck in unaffordable uh, housing choices. So I think what we have to do along with um, uh, thinking about climate change, uh, which is a reality, which is one of the greatest, if not the greatest challenge that mankind faces today. Um, we have to also think about how we will address and we must address issues with mobility and issues with affordability. I think the kind of density that we have uh, promoted as a policy um, instrument um, is not very uh, sensitive to affordability concerns. Um, if you look at the density in Manhattan, density in San Francisco, density in London, um, there's no escaping the truth that these places are also the most congested. They are also the most unaffordable places on the planet. So you cannot, so cities are for people to live. If it gets difficult to get to them, if it gets difficult to live in them, if it becomes unaffordable, then certainly we are not doing the right things. Public transit could help, um, and it has helped. It makes downtowns functionable. Otherwise, they would not function without public transit. But I think now is a time for us to question the, um, the, the, the status quo that we have half a million jobs in downtown Toronto, half a million jobs. Do we really need that concentration of jobs? Do we really have to bring everyone here? Do we really have to do this? Or take this opportunity, this social experiment to see if we can decentralize our work locations to reduce the burden on mobility and allowing more land to be developed in a more walkable, conducive fashion. I'm, when I say more land to be developed, I'm not advocating for sprawl. I'm not advocating for um, communities with just cars. I'm saying livable, walkable communities, but they don't have to be within 10 minutes of downtowns. They, we have to bring more land developable in, in livable communities to take pressure off the central cities, which are becoming increasingly congested and increasingly unaffordable. Yeah, I'm just going to pull on a thread on that, Murtaza. Um, I'm really curious what you think um, the future holds for transit-oriented development and or transit-oriented communities, as the provincial government is calling it. Uh, based on this experience, um, what do you think the future importance will be for commuter suburbs and the workforce relying on go trains that are oriented towards the downtown and, and new subways? That is a huge provincial investment focus. I think the, the last mile challenge, uh, first and last mile challenge with uh, regional trains is very difficult to, to address. And um, you can, you can, how do you get to go trains? I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a transit rider. I take go train every day or used to take go train every day. But the moment those parking lots are full, um, then, and that's about nine o'clock. From nine onwards, the trains are running pretty much empty on the busiest corridors. So you ask yourself, is there a workable model to, to be able to run um, efficient and uh, transit in a way that allows people to get to, to work. I think there are other constraints that limit the viability of commuter rail. Uh, public transit through subways is a, is a different animal, but commuter rails has its big challenge of how do you overcome the first and last mile. But allowing people, uh, what Ken just said, um, uh, redundancy and diversity of modes so that people are not captive to automobiles or not captive to another different mode. For example, if you take subway out, and, and then people realized that the whole locational decisions were predicated on the fact that they would travel by subway. And now certainly subway is out and there's no redundancy in subway. What to do now when the system breaks down? I think we should think about redundancies and resilience um, in, in, a, in a variety of fashions, but also for multi-modes and, and allowing people to make better decisions while being strictly cognizant of our limitations and responsibilities as it relates to uh, climate change. Um, Ken, you can respond to this question if you like. I'm also curious what you think um, the response from government policy and planning might be um, going forward and what, what should it be? Well, I, I think if we don't treat this horrific experience as an opportunity to learn and think about our practices differently, um, we will be making an enormous mistake. I, I've been quoting Ram Emanuel lately who talked about making use of a crisis. And I think that is exactly the situation we're in. 
So there are a whole bunch of things that occur to me. Um, one is we have been so intent in order to um, thinking we were being economical, we were saving money, sometimes uh, referred to as the austerity agenda, in value engineering out redundancy. I think we have to turn that on its head and value engineer back in redundancy, multiple ways of doing many things, uh, a belt and suspenders in many cases. Had we not, just to take a simple obvious example, had recourse to the internet in these days as an alternative to us being in a, in a hall right now all together, mm. uh, think, think of how difficult the world would be. So we've had that opportunity to pivot and use something else. Now, if we apply that thinking, talking about what governments can learn, to everything, we should be designing our streets so that they operate in multiple modes. When the traffic is way down and we want a social distance, we should be removing cars from the streets and allowing people to spread out. Transit is great, but if transit is the only way you can get around or the only way you can get access to the things you need, you're in big trouble. You have to be able to walk to those things or bike to those things or have a number of ways of doing that or thin out people in transit, have a different mode of operating. Um, I think when it comes to the point that you started with a little while ago, Cherise, about whether we need to concentrate everything in one radial hub in downtown Toronto, uh, clearly not. We have the emergence of a regional city with many centers scattered throughout the greater Toronto Hamilton region. We should be taking every advantage of the opportunity to make those places throughout the region possess as many of the qualities of desirable urbanity as we possibly can, including combining opportunities to, for people to live and work. So they're not obliged to make those long commutes. Again, dealing with, <clears throat> with these twin challenges of um, being able to deal with a crisis like this pandemic, but also addressing environmental sustainability. One other thing I'll just throw out there, which is bringing public health officials into the planning discussion. In the work I'm doing with Brampton right now, the uh, medical officer of health for Peel Region and her staff are very much involved in all of these discussions about how to make these successful 15, 20 minute neighborhoods and how do we fit them out so that in times like these, people have a way of responding. Cherise, if I may um, um, follow up on um, um, what Justin sure. said. Yeah. Um, look, there are f I'm looking at the participants. There are 500 people right now participating in this online dialogue. I don't think we have ever done um, a mass uh, collaborative discussion with such a large audience ever before. And why is it possible? Uh, is it possible because it is making the best use of online technologies and making the best use of a crisis at our hand that we cannot meet in person. And if it were to happen that way, we would have probably 50 to 100 people, maybe 150. But right now we are in a group of 500 people made possible from because of this, this embracing technology. I give you an example of how city building can change for the betterment of, of uh, um, some um, agencies or entities. Take Ryerson University as an example. Um, we have been building uh, structures um, over the past 15 years or 20 years. And essentially we're building classrooms. And then those classrooms are used. And then when they are not used, they're sitting empty, especially during summer. And our ability to teach is constrained by space. How many students can we fit in one classroom or a lecture hall? Now with online learning and teaching, we can teach live to not just a 50, 100, 400, 800 students. So we can focus our energies and our budgets and our dollars, not on brick and mortar, but on learning, but on mentoring students, but on providing them with feedback, sort of making geography not irrelevant, but slightly less relevant. This crisis allows us to rethink. We can spend money on brick and mortar, billions and billions of dollars of erecting new buildings, or 
as a university, we invest in students taking the same money and giving it out to produce new scholarship, new intellectual scholarship, which is knowledge making, which is the primary responsibility of a university rather than building structures. So there is a trade off. It is up to us to either recognize it or ignore it after this COVID-19 is done, go back to uh, building more classrooms and then figuring out, oh, we ran out of space five months later or five years later. So can I jump in on, on the question of... Um, okay, the, make it quick, Ken, because we got to get to the Q&A, but yeah, we... Okay, sure. very quickly, uh, the virtual world and the physical world. And I'll just say, uh, one of my colleagues with whom I'm working on Sidewalk Labs, which might surprise people, uh, pointed out to me that for all those people who think that the, the virtual world can substitute almost entirely for the physical world, this experiment is showing us why we don't want to do that, why we actually need that physical connection with each other, in addition to all the wonderful things which digital technology can offer us. And so one of the things we have to learn coming out of this is how we combine them. Great. Um, on that note, um, I do like how both of you had ended with some great, important lessons from this experience and how it can shape our approach to city building as we go forward. So thank you. Now I'm gonna throw it over to Richard who has been busy running around the audience collecting questions virtually. Um, so many great questions in the chat room. Um, so Richard, we're, we're dying to know what questions you wanna start off with first. Okay, as expected, more questions than we'll ever get to, but uh, we are gonna use these questions uh, as, as feed-ins for future conversations as well. So if we don't get to them, I apologize. Um, I'm gonna start with a question from Mark Richardson. Uh, who asks, all of the city and provincial programs for new affordable housing, like TCHC revitalization, open doors, housing now, and inclusionary zoning are based on increasing on increased density and smaller units sizes in order to make the construction math work. Will the post-COVID-19 housing market jeopardize the delivery of some of these affordable housing projects? Let, let me jump in on that two aspects I want to comment on. Uh, first, the smaller units. I think one of the things this may be teaching us, and that goes back to the redundancy and resiliency, is that we need actually to have more space in our units than we've been thinking. We need to be able to pivot. And if we're educating our kids at home, if we're uh, working from home, if we're doing things from home that we weren't previously doing, that extra space makes an enormous amount of difference. That would be one thing. The other thing I think it is pointing out to us very dramatically, and this is being revealed uh, right now in statistics coming from the US and from Canada, is who is disproportionately falling victim to this horrible pandemic. And it is no surprise people who live in precarious situations, both in terms of employment and housing, and they can be localized by geography. So it's pointing a great finger at the inequities in the way we've been building cities and the need to build into our neighborhoods, into our communities, uh, a much greater range of housing options, not just in isolated places, but throughout. Murtaza, do you want to comment on that or do you want to hear Yes, I, I think the, the two things that, I, that concern me about this is A, uh, thinking only affordability in terms of rental um, and thinking that if we can just find ways to build high rises, small units and put them in um, uh, um, income oriented rents and whatnot. I think there are ways to think um, uh, uh, in, in holistically about bringing people uh, into home, home ownership. I think right now, one of the things people are looking at is the, the issues with uh, rental being in times of crisis. It exposes people to much bigger vulnerabilities than those who are owner occupied. Second thing is uh, clustering low income uh, households together um, it creates these project like the US projects, American experiments with projects. I think the, the experiment Canada did before where people were dispersed across where they were able to live in regular communities rather than just being subject to 
low income communities um, that that sh that experiment was better than having people the opportunity to live in decent places and then rent gear to income uh, subsidizes their their rents i think that would be a better approach building clusters of poverty is is a false solution it has not worked in the us it has not worked here for us in parts of toronto and i don't want to mention the names but you know what i am referring to clusters of poverty is not the solution right richard do you have another question okay the, yeah and it's probably uh it's a big question and it probably might take us to the very last question as well and i probably realize we've only asked two but sean hurdle was the first to get in on the action and he asked a big one wow he says i'm concerned that we're oversimplifying here we can't design our way out of problems we need structural changes that include wealth redistribution better democracy social equity better housing, job services, access, et cetera. Comment on the broader issues is his question. Um, I would stay, sorry, can I jump in? I would stay away from that approach because then it makes you feel that the challenge is too large and you will never be able to solve it. I think the way forward is to take challenges, break them into pieces. We do not build a full airplane in one place. We assemble it in one place, but we find solutions in different parts. Same thing with streetcars. They're not built in one room. They're assembled in a bigger place. So there are bigger challenges. Ken mentioned about income inequalities. They are more pronounced and getting even more pronounced and visible in, in urban centers. Um, there are larger issues at stake, yes, but I would say that let's focus on the very issue of how social distancing and pandemics may become more frequent in the future and, and disrupt our economy, disrupt our societies. We should be prepared to alter our behaviors as well as the future built form to be more resilient to such disruptions, which will be out of our control. Same is the case with challenges resulting from climate change. We would have to be resilient and we have to modify our behaviors because those challenges will be way beyond the, the, the amount of resources available at our disposal to deal with them. So th this is a case where there might be a slight difference uh, of emphasis between Murtasa and myself, I'm not sure. Uh, but I think one of the lessons from this is that we cannot solve problems in silos, that it is actually forcing people in different disciplines when we talk about government in different agencies and departments, public sector, private sector, philanthropic sector, to put our heads together and look for lateral solutions that are actually dealing simultaneously with a bunch of different problems. Because in the end, to quote uh, David Crombie, everything here is connected to everything else. And it, it is really difficult to solve one of these issues. That, that's why you know, I mentioned the, the knee-jerk reaction to say density is the problem, which was in Rosenthal's article in the New York Times, implying that the solution is to spread ourselves out over the countryside, raises all kinds of issues of collateral damage that come with that, which can only be understood when you look at all the variables. Um, Richard, it sounds like we've got room for yeah. another question. Why don't I ask, I mean, this is the second question and I thought it was quite good and it relates to actually something uh, Richard Florida has been talking about in a 10 point plan that he's uh, advanced through various uh, mediums, um, but it relates to recreational facilities. How can recreational facilities, and I think that's to be taken very broadly, whether that's theaters, sports arenas, uh, parks, uh, equipment and so forth, how can recreational facilities drive to to drive social and economic recovery? How can we, we pivot these very things that, that we normally bring us together to help us uh, as we get through this, this chapter that we're in right now? Richard, I would add to that list arts and culture, which Richard of course. also had in his list of 10 points. I think we need all of those things that speak to mind and body, that speak to the human spirit, uh, that connect us, and so absolutely they're turning out to be in many cases the most vulnerable because all the venues are canceled people who made their living as artists or musicians or people in any of those fields are suddenly finding that uh, their ability to survive is really threatened uh, so as much as we think about business in a typical sense and rescuing business and making sure it remains whole i couldn't agree more i think we have to think about sustaining those things through this period 
um, because if we fail to do that, and those are the very things that cities are all about and what brings us together, um, I think we'll be making an enormous mistake. I would add to say that um, another place of congregation in urban settings is restaurants and bars. And I think we are um, facing a grave challenge there. I think about 800,000 people have lost already jobs. And, and I've heard estimates from the industry that maybe one in three restaurants will not reopen. And I think the, the amount of number of people who will lose their life um, livelihood um, requires us to, to find ways to sustain these. Uh, yes, absolutely, we need um, concert halls and art galleries and, and whatnot, but the first most often place that we congregate at is, is restaurants and, and food courts. And, um, and these are the people who are losing their jobs at a very fast pace. And when the recovery happens and whenever it happens, it may be too late for, to resuscitate some. And if there's a way for us together um, to find uh, ways of ordering in or takeouts to sustain uh, these, in, these, um, uh, these outlets now, um, it would be for our benefit so that we can, when things go normal, be able to go out and have meals with our friends. Thanks, Murtaza. And um, just to let folks know, we are hoping to tackle that issue in a future session um, called the Future of Retail Neighborhoods. And I'm just looking at some of these, these questions. There was a question on, from Michael Morrissey, how does transit survive social distancing? We're hoping to um, talk about that one on the future of mobility coming up. And just finally, Gil Penaloza has said, 45 minutes is too short. <laughs> we need 75 to 90 minutes. But unfortunately, we're wrapping it up now after 45 minutes. Um, so I wanna thank our speakers and just, yeah, next slide. Um, also to point you into the direction of some of their very important work. Um, in addition um, to what's on this slide, you can find uh, Ken Greenberg's writing and work on this topic at kengreenberg.ca. Ken, is that correct? Yes, it is. And Murtaza, um, also in addition to what's on the slide, um, is doing, has been doing a regular, um, a regular column in the financial post in the business section. How long have you been doing that? Since 2017, we have over 150 columns that have appeared about 900 times coast to coast in Canada. Okay, great. And Murtaza, just um, his team at the Urban Analytics Institute has just finished a report on um, density and pandemics, which should be up on the site now or soon? Yes, it's up and we have sent a link uh, to attendees through, through the chat box. Okay, great. Um, last slide, please. Um, so I just wanna wrap things up and thank everybody for joining us and hope that you can join us next week at the same time for our next session, which is the future of nine to five, which we started to get into a little bit today about where we locate employment, um, you know, future of downtowns, of how we commute and get around to our workplaces. So join us with Pedro Barada, who's with Ryerson's Future Skills Center, and Marcy Birchfield, who's with the Toronto Region Board of Trade. Okay, until then, please stay healthy and safe and stay engaged. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.